This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends and a very, very happy Thanksgiving Day weekend to all of you down here in flyover country in Auburn, Alabama. Of course, we're focused on this football game against our hated rival, the Alabama Crimson Tide. But uh, today we have a guest, a repeat return guest, Justin Romando, uh, the uh, editorial director of antiwar.com. If you're not reading him on that site, and especially if you're not following him on Twitter at Justin Romando, you are missing out. Uh, he recently wrote an article called How We Will Win, uh, which was about the Trump revolution and, and basically talking about the libertarian angles uh, that you sometimes have to look hard for in that revolution. But we're so pleased to have him with us. And Justin, good morning. Thank you. Good to talk to you. Yes, it's great to be back. Well, I think I know what you're going to say, but let me ask you this. Do you think that Trump and Brexit actually represent a real threat to this inevitability of globalism and Francis Fukuyama's view of the world? Or do you think this is a, a hiccup or a road bump for, for progressives? Well, I mean, for every action, there's a reaction. So, you know, the media elites and the whole political class have been, you know, trying to impose this, this agenda of, you know, world government, uh, on us for oh a long time and so people are waking up and going hey you know what we don't want this so whether there's a counter reaction to the reaction and what that will be we don't know yet you know of course in england there is a counter reaction you know you had a mass mobilization of the political class and the elites, they actually had a march, and they had a had an online petition. Of course, it was being signed by people in Tunisia. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, you know, the battle was on. There is a battle, and libertarians have a side. They ought to start recognizing what side they're on. Yeah, it's interesting to me. I remember talking to Lou Rockwell uh, maybe a year ago about how neoconservatives and the war party wouldn't let Trump win, so to speak. N now that he's won, how do you think neoconservatives and the war party will try to control him? Right. I mean, that's what, you know, like that's what we're seeing with the appointments, you know, drama, especially over secretary of state and all these national security, you know, positions. But, you know, and policy is personnel to a great degree, but then you have Trump. I mean, here is somebody who not only said that, you know, the whole Iraq war was a total disaster, and he said it at the South Carolina GOP primary debate and was booed. And of course, he, you know, his uh, whole response was, go ahead and boo me. And he laughed at them. And then he said, we were lied into war. Now, that is a radical critique that, you know, I think that only a few people have made. Um, and so that is, I mean, he is now the president of these United States. So what that means to the neocons is they're in big, big trouble and they know it. Well, let, let me read what I thought was a very profound sentence from the article I mentioned earlier that you wrote. And this is speaking to libertarians. Uh, you say, yet yeah, what they fail to understand is that his, meaning Trump's, proposed dismantling of the new world order, America's role as world policeman, would, if put into effect, represent the biggest rollback of state power since the American Revolution. And I, I, I certainly think that this is where a lot of libertarians fall down, that they fail to understand that this pushback against elites is actually a, a profoundly uh, libertarian opportunity. Right. Um, you know, Murray emphasized this, and people have sort of forgotten that. But war is the health of the state. I mean, the whole mechanism of statism, and it is a mechanism, will run backwards if we can just start dismantling the empire. And, and that's, what, that's our primary task. You know, and the folks over at Reason Magazine don't understand that. You know, like they think, well, you know, 
if we have gay marriage and if people can smoke pot, then, you know, we're going to start having more liberty. No, wrong. You're not. The key is let's start thinking about America first and America first foreign policy. And then almost automatically, you know, the state will be rolled back here at home, you know, because look at all the money that is sent overseas. I mean, trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars spent, $3 trillion spent on the Iraq and Afghan wars. And that's at a minimum. Uh, So we can't really have a debate about, well, you know, should we have a welfare state or not? Because all our money is tied up abroad. Um, And so, you know, we go into debt and then, you know, the Fed keeps printing more money to prop the whole thing up. So that's the mechanism right there. We can, you know, as Murray said, we can roll back the 20th century in a famous speech to the John Randolph Club. But, you know, we have to beat the Mensheviks, you know. We got the Bolsheviks, and now the Mensheviks were living inside a Menshevik fantasy. <laughs> Is that what he, you know, that's what he said in his speech. And, yeah, we are. And their vision is global. And so we've got to push back on that level. Well, you mentioned earlier that personnel or policy, that we're seeing some uh, neoconservative favorites uh, floated as possible cabinet picks. Do you ever think that Trump is trolling us to an extent? In other words, he he lists or floats the idea of a controversial nominee for State Department like John Bolton, and then ultimately his real nominee will be someone that is harder for the Senate to go after because relative to John Bolton, they're less controversial. All right. I mean, you know, it's useless to really speculate, you know, until he actually makes an announcement. You know, especially the Secretary of State thing. I mean, all kinds of people have been floated, even Dana Rohrabacher. Right. So, you know, we don't really know what's going on. Um, You know, I think a lot of this is, you know, the people who want the job, like Romney, for example, are actually floating their own name. (laughs) And uh, Kellyanne Conway, his uh, campaign manager, actually said that. I mean, you know, like not about Romney, but about in general. And so um, I would take it all with a pillar of salt. It's interesting. Everybody who wants a job is the kind of person we don't want in the job. At least it seems to me. Well, yeah, you know, maybe that's true and maybe it's not. But I mean, you know, if somebody is an actual non-interventionist, they would want a job there so that they could you know, fulfill the promise of the Trump campaign. That's kind of a libertarian type, you know, generalization, but it may not be actually empirically true. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let me ask you this. Cabinet aside, what do you think the best case scenario and worst case scenario for libertarians, what does Trump's first year potentially look like? Number one, I mean, here is the main threat to peace in the world today, and that is conflict with Russia. I mean, all this stuff about, you know, the Middle East and Iraq and Afghanistan, I mean, that's over. So, you know, the next step, and of course, you could see this from the actual campaign that we just endured. Uh, We had Hillary Clinton actually calling Trump a, quote, Russian puppet, unquote. I mean, it's just unbelievable. That's, that, that hasn't happened since the early days of our republic, when you had the Federalists and the Jeffersonians going after each other. One said, you're a French puppet. And then the other one said, you're a British puppet. And of course, it was the Federalists who were the British puppets. Um, as as a Gore Vidal pointed out, uh, Hamilton was a British agent. So this is pretty extreme. And it's clear that, you know, the Clintons have always been anti-Russian. I mean, that's what the Kosovo War was about. I mean, ever since the, the uh, Russians overthrew communism, you'll notice that the left has been anti-Russian. <laughs> and there's a reason for that. You know, like the main threat now is conflict with Russia, you know, like the revival of the Cold War. And this has been going on for quite a while. 
I mean, ever since Russia refused to endorse the invasion of Iraq, um, you know, the neocons have been been after them. And so this is the new big issue. Are we going to have a new Cold War with Russia? Trump says no. And the left says yes. So now, I mean, you know, it's very interesting. Every, say, 30, 40 years, there's a switch in polarities, you know, as far as foreign policy is concerned. At one point, the uh, right was anti-interventionist back in the 1930s and 40s and up until the mid-50s even. And then came the Cold War. And so, you know, the left was anti-interventionist and the right was, you know, like, let's roll back communism. Let's, you know, bomb the Russians. And now it is switching again. And the old right is rising again. And Trump... Trump's victory is a great victory for us. I mean, I can't even begin to even tell you. It's, it's a seismic event. It's an earthquake, and it's shaking the whole world. Well, it's interesting when you mention this because Trump, I think, divided libertarians as much as he divided anyone. Uh, is your view that, that not only on foreign policy but on all things, that the left in this country has become just so bad that – defeating Hillary was more important than libertarian purity? Look, you know, the libertarian movement has always been divided since 1983. You know, you have the Coctopus people and, you know, you have the Rothbardians, basically. And out of that split came, on the one hand, you know, the Cato Institute types, and on the other hand, the Ron Paul movement. So... You know, like there was no libertarian leadership. And so Trump won because he saw what the real issue is, what the real issues are. You know, even his protectionist stuff, you know, you have to look at that and go, well, look, okay, he is criticizing the consequences of American imperialism because what's the deal that we make with the South Korea? Okay, here's the deal. We will give you, quote unquote, free trade, but one way free trade. If you will let us occupy your country. So you become part of the empire and we'll have free trade. So what's the result? Well, you know, the result is that we have the Rust Belt, Right. And, and, and South Korea has U.S. military and, and the money behind it. Right. And so, you know, the same is true of Japan. And now they're moving into Vietnam. They're actually going to have a base in Vietnam, a military base. And uh, we are, you know, giving them military aid. It is all to encircle China. That's what this Asian pivot was all about under, uh, under Obama. But beyond the foreign policy, don't you feel like there is a, a globalist mindset among certain libertarians? Is libertarianism overly tied to universalism? In other words, do we need to convince the whole world that libertarianism is the way or should we just be worrying about ourselves? And I would argue the latter. You know, we saw this after some of the French terrorist attacks, you know, all, all these cries, well, they need our version of the Second Amendment. But that's that's not really how Murray saw the world, I don't think. Well, yeah. And, you know, in fact, I wrote a column on this whole question called libertarianism in one country. And if you look at what has been going on in the rest of the world, I mean, where has there been a libertarian revolution like the American Revolution? I mean, all the... All the liberal in the old, you know, classical liberal sense, all those revolutions in the mid 1800s failed. They failed. And so what you have is, you know, statism. I mean, you know, like America is surrounded by a sea of statism. We're an island. And so we have to have libertarianism in one country. Now, you know, ideas travel internationally, and it's possible that there could be a libertarian revolution in the intellectual, you know, and political sense 
abroad. But there's no way to import that, certainly not by force of arms and certainly not with U.S. government propaganda. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. So for the foreseeable future, yes, if we're going to have libertarianism, it's going to be in a single country. And that's that. And if somebody is living in, say, Argentina or something and they want to have freedom, well, they should come to the United States. I mean, that's my advice to them if they can, of course. (laughs) <laughs> under Trump. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to be unbelievable to watch how this first year unfolds because none of us were expecting it. Uh, again, the article I mentioned by Justin Romano is called How We Will Win. We'll link to it on our YouTube page and also on our website. Great conversation, fascinating insights. Justin, thank you so much for your time. And ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.